Emmett Smith and Ron DeSantis, they're beefing. They're beefing over DEI, the Department of Expanding Ignorance. I'll explain today. Where I was Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Monday. Thanks for joining me. Awesome, awesome, awesome show planned for you today. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing to GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS to get a free 119 Heritage Ham plus $25 off any box with your subscription. Did you hear that? Go back, go back. I want to... Tell, tell these guys what they're getting. Use my promo code FEARLESS at GoodRanchers.com. Get a free $119 Heritage Ham plus $25 off any box with your subscription. Uh, thank you, Good Ranchers, and thank you for uh, supporting the Fearless Army. Awesome show a, uh, for you today. Uh, we're going to address Emmett Smith. And what's going on at the University of Florida. We'll start the show there. Uh, then I will give you my uh, daily dose of Stephen A. Smith capping, because he's capping again. Virtually, if his mouth is moving, he's pretty much lying. I'll walk you through his latest lie. Uh, and then <laughs> I'm going to take a look at and explain the consequences of Shannon Sharp. Uh, naming himself or running for office as the most popular man of black Twitter. There's a boomerang effect. There are consequences to that. When you uh, ask black Twitter to anoint you king, uh, don't be surprised uh, when your peasants, when your supporters turn on you. Uh, Shannon Sharp's learning those consequences. So we'll do all that today. We'll try to wrap it up in a tight little hour, hour and 10 minute bundle uh, today. The entire time I'm doing this, you should be hitting the subscriptions and the likes button on YouTube. If you're listening over Apple, uh, give us that five star review. Help us fight the algorithms that are fighting against us. Uh, but <clears throat> let's go ahead and get into this fire starter because I'm kind of excited about uh, unpacking this. Emmett Smith and Ron DeSantis uh, disagree about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Smith, the NFL's all-time leading rusher, believes DEI programs are essential to the success of his alma mater, the University of Florida. DeSantis, a Yale and Harvard grad, and the sitting governor of Florida believes DEI is toxic and should be eliminated. A law DeSantis signed into legislation compelled the University of Florida to ax its 13-person DEI department. This act enraged Emmett Smith, the Dallas Cowboys great. He released an angry statement yesterday. Uh, let me quote from it, or I'm gonna tell you the whole thing. Uh, I am utterly disgusted by UF's decision and the precedent that it sets. Without the DEI department, the job falls into the office of the provost who already has their hands full to raise money for the university and continue to advance the academic studies and athletic programs. We cannot continue to believe and trust that a team of leaders all made up of the same background will make the right decision when it comes to equality and diversity. History has already proven that is not the case. We need diverse thinking and backgrounds to enhance our university and the DEI department is necessary to accomplish those goals. Instead of showing courage and leadership, we continue to fail based on systemic issues. And with this decision, UF has conformed to the political pressure of today's time. To the many minority athletes at UF, Please be aware and vocal about this decision by the university who is now closing the doors on other minorities without any oversight. And to those who think it's not your problem and stay on the sidelines and say nothing, 
You are complicit in supporting systemic issues. Emmett Smith. Yes, uh, Emmett is walking a very fine line here. He doesn't want to say systemic racism. He just says systemic issues. He's trying to uh, be the ultimate supporter of uh, Black Lives Matters and DEI and all the stuff that we as black people are trained, programmed, commanded to support. He's trying to do all that while still uh, being somewhat honest. But uh, the question is, who should we believe? The football player or the governor? To no one's surprise, I believe the governor. That will put me at odds with many black people. We've been trained to evaluate all situations through the lens of race, not right and wrong. Emmett Smith is black. DeSantis is white. Diversity, equity, and inclusion allegedly benefits black people. I don't believe it does. It primarily convinces black people that their real expertise and contribution to society is managing the mindset of white people. It promotes a harmful codependency. Years ago, <clears throat> I had a friend who was a mid-level editor at ESPN. He was not a good editor. He wrote poorly. He saw his strength as managing people and formulating ideas. He told me he would always have a job at ESPN because he could be a voice in the room that would stop a white executive from saying or doing something that was racist. I asked him, that's your strength. Stopping white people from revealing their bigotry. That's what you have to offer the world. Mm, think that through. I, I asked him, think that, that, that's, that's what you have to offer as a professional. You went to college, you, you, you spent years in journalism, and your primary strength is, <laughs> man, I can get in the room and stop white people from doing anything publicly that makes them appear racist. That's going to keep me employed. That's the reality of DEI. It's a department filled with blacks, the LGBTQ, and women who are in charge of managing the thoughts of white decision makers. Their job is to impose and normalize a Marxist way of thinking on race, sexuality, and gender roles. It's a cult. If you disagree with the DEI department, you're labeled as racist, homophobic, transphobic, and or misogynistic. DEI departments in academia and corporate America are the enforcement arm of the Marxist revolution. Emmett Smith foolishly believes skin color determines whether there will be a diversity of thought at Florida. DEI departments eliminate diverse thoughts and install a superficial color diversity. The people leading DEI departments have no real skill beyond imposing their worldview on the work or academic culture. They don't fix engines, work an assembly line, develop technology, research medical advances, teach history, etc. They provide no tangible value. They evangelize for Marxism. Now, as a Christian, I'd love for universities and corporations to fund Father, Son, and Holy Spirit departments. These mid-level executives would make sure that the work and academic cultures were consistent with a biblical worldview. If anyone disagreed with the FSH department, they would be labeled anti-Christian and placed in a two-week seminar to realign their thinking. Of course, everyone ob would object to companies and state-funded universities creating departments to impose a religious worldview. So if that's the case, why is it okay for DEI zealots to take over HR departments? Why do DEI zealots get to pass out $10,000 speaking fees to outside vendors and evangelists who promote Marxism? It's all a giant Ponzi scheme. They promote and exaggerate racism to justify their six-figure jobs. They're not attempting to eliminate racism. The more they discover and or invent racism, the more valuable they are. George Floyd justifies the DEI department at the University of Florida and at Costco. 
There's an endless supply of white executives who need advice on how to properly honor a black career criminal who overdosed on fentanyl while being restrained by police. Same thing goes for Juneteenth. Or maybe they tell the school president how to respond when the sensitivities of a black student are offended because there aren't enough black students in their dorm. This is the career of a six-figure salary DEI executive. They mitigate the guilt of their white saviors and make sure everyone at work publicly agrees with same-sex marriage or at least has the good sense to never publicly object. DEI, it's the department expanding ignorance. That's my fire starter. I'm going to expound here. The people, Emmett Smith and, and everybody else up in arms because the state of Florida has done what other states need to do. They've turned very hostile towards uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The spread of Marxist ideology. The, the, the spread of a worldview that everybody has to adopt. Again, th th there is no interest in diversity of thought. DEI departments in academia and in corporate America impose a single worldview and pass out punishments to anybody that doesn't hop on board enthusiastically with that single worldview. It's a very secular worldview. I, I want to be clear here, and I'm personalize this to some degree. And it's just like Emmett Smith and and the DEI people that work at these different universities. They pretend like there's no universities out here that if you want the black experience, you can get it. If you want to be in an environment where you're just enveloped in blackness, it's available to you. And I'm not saying this as uh, relegating people to this. I am uh, financially and personally involved in the education of my, uh, one of my nephews and my niece. One goes to North Carolina Central, I think right outside of Durham. The other goes to Hampton University. I'm deeply involved in the education of both of these kids. I believe in HBCUs. And if you want the black experience, I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is as it relates to HBCUs. I don't have a problem with them. But what cracks me up and, and just boggles my mind are the people that are pursuing the so-called black experience but want to go to a predominantly white school and then turn that predominantly white school into a HBCU. Make up your mind. What, what do you really want? Do you th is there a diversity, equity, inclusion program at Hampton? Is there? I don't know. I, I would think not. Do the black schools have diversity, equity, inc inclusion officers? M maybe they do, and I'm just unaware. And maybe there are people at HBCUs, they've hired a gang of white people to work, with inside, work inside their school to make sure whatever white students there have a white experience and feel welcomed at a black university. This is the entire concept of DEI. This is a, a, a Ponzi scheme where, where people who get into white universities through affirmative action programs and are poorly educated at those universities, what kind of jobs are available to them after they graduate college? They barely get through college. They're not really qualified. They haven't studied anything in college that really prepares them to be creators, business owners, legitimate contributors to society. 
And so what does the left and the people financing this, what do they offer those people? Well, we're going to create a whole new profession. You can go to college and you can study black history. You can study uh, gymnastics or, you know, uh, P.E. Uh, you can uh, general studies. You can leave college with uh, what is the sociology? Is that another one of these degrees that really doesn't mean anything? You haven't really learned a skill. You can leave there having learned nothing, perhaps feeling insecure about your entire experience. And guess what, America, or you black people that have uh, taken this handout and taken this affirmative action opportunity, uh, we've got a career for you. We're going to create an industry of black people who go to companies to manage white people. So we're going to set up this profession of diversity, equity, and inclusion. There will be jobs at all universities for diversity officers, and there will be jobs in all of major corporations, and even smaller corporations at this point, that have diversity chiefs. So you can get a job at Ford. You don't have to know anything about a car. You don't have to know anything about an assembly line. You don't have to know anything really about anything. But we'll name you chief diversity officer, and it's your job to run around the plant and manage different white uh, executives and decision makers and tell them, hey, here's the memo you should put out for Juneteenth. Oh, uh, George Floyd, career criminal. Yeah, he just died on tape. He was filled with fentanyl and cops were trying to restrain him. And as an executive, here's some talking points if any of your black employees are upset about George Floyd. Here's what you say to them. And here's the note that you should put out company-wide. Here's the email you should put out. Here's the event we should have honoring George Floyd. That's your job. Running around to teach and to tell white people, here's how to manage your relationship with your black employees. You're, you're basically Steven from Django. That, that's, you're the consigliere for the white executives over all the black employees, and there's just gonna be a handful of them that are going to, oh God, uh, someone on the assembly line called me boy, and I need the company to do something about it. Oh, so someone uh, said at work, uh, they didn't think George Floyd was murdered. I need the company to do something about it. Th that's your job, to run around and make sure the company makes all, whatever a black person or certainly whatever a gay person thinks it, or, or, or whatever environment they want is to make sure that that environment is very, very warm and fuzzy and does nothing to upset the sensibilities of a black person or someone in the alphabet mafia. That's your job. It's, it's great work. I mean, there's six-figure jobs for doing this, and you do community outreach, and you make sure that there's enough rap songs played at the arena so that you know anybody black that comes to the arena they feel warm and fuzzy and, and make sure the n-word is dropped in enough rap songs so that they feel included that, that that that's your job and then you also get to oh uh, pass out checks to guest speakers and other people who whose their entire job is to run around and to tell to teach and train white people on how to be better allies for blacks and gays. And the, the, the DEI department gets to cut $10,000 checks. We brought in this guest speaker and that guest speaker. I wanna show you, I wanna show you the, uh, this is what DEI executives do, that Ashley Shackelford, Let, let's, let's, does anybody remember this meme? This is a woman that uh, was brought into some university, some major university, to teach white people about how racist they are. 
and and it, you know this was a very popular picture over social media and, and this is literally I'm sure she's educated at some college she's not really qualified to do much she doesn't know how to dress professionally uh, she certainly has no discipline with the fork this is you're the DEI lead, and so you've given her a check for $10,000 to come in and wag their finger at white people and say, all white people are racist, you're the reason. Put up, Brittany Cooper, this, she's a professor at Rutgers. This is the woman that has put out videos saying that her weight problems are a result of white racism. She goes on TV, she, she is employed at Rutgers, through, I'm sure through some affirmative action and quota system or whatever, she's some sort of professor and she talks about racism. This is a whole industry that they've created, that there are all these people with no real qualifications who spend all of their time talking to other people about racism and how we can combat it and how you can not be racist and what you can and cannot say. They're, they're trainers for white people. And, and then they get upset. And they've created an entire industry for blacks and gays to run around and tell white people how to behave. But if a white person says, you know what? I have an opinion on how blacks and gays should behave. No, 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 no. You, you can't say that. That would be racist. That would be homophobic. That would be transphobic. But departments all over the country, virtually every major university and minor university has some kind of DEI department where blacks and gays scold, instruct, advise white people on how to behave. And we all have think it's normal. We all think this, this is necessary, that this is improving society. But if a white person says, hey, you know, all of this rap music where you calling yourself the N-word, you're talking about shooting up each other, and, and, and you're calling women bitches and hoes, I have an opinion on that. I don't think that's healthy. Well, that person is racist and needs to shut up and could be eliminated from polite society and or their job. This is insanity. This is the department of expanding ignorance. And I wish that Emmett Smith would kick back and say, man, I ran the football and I was great at it, and people loved me because I the way I ran the football. I'm not a public intellectual. I'm not a thought leader. And yes, he's a prominent Florida alum because of his football career. He wants to fire off opinions about the football program at Florida. Have at it. But DEI departments being eliminated because they're creating a religion. And, and that's what it is. It's a religion. And I know that Emmett is someone who claims a faith in Christ. And so, Emmett, I, I would ask you, why do universities have departments whose job is to go around and preach a worldview and impose quotas and systems and make sure Everybody thinks and says the right thing about race, sex, and gender. But no university, no business would ever employ someone to make sure that the culture fit a biblical worldview. You don't find that strange? that they can turn DEI, which is Marxism, and Marxism is hostile to religious faith, they can create a department to impose those beliefs 
And because of your racial idolatry, because you think there's some sort of benefit to you as a black person. Well, I, yeah, I know this isn't consistent with my biblical worldview, but it helps me. And, and black people get jobs out of it. And black people have people on campus who will come in and, and be arbiters of any racial dispute they have on campus. And so when a black student is talked disrespectfully to by another black student, or perhaps treated disrespectfully by another black student, the DEI departments have no opinion on that. They don't come in and manage those situations. They only manage the problems that they believe are created by white people. Where do most of our problems come from, Emmett? From outside or within? I mean, I'm speaking in reality, not in speculation. Don't tell me about uh, the Proud Boys or the Patriot Front or whatever group, you know. We know. <laughs> ah. It's, of course, I side with Ron DeSantis. Uh, DEI is a plague. It's toxic. Uh, I wish that Emmett would stick to a lane uh, that he's a bit more versed in. The, the statement he put out, I'm sure, will score him points uh, with the right people and with the people that are the puppet masters that have drawn up this lane for black people. Your job is to go out and manage the thoughts of white people in high profile executive decision making positions. And your job is to get them to adopt a Marxist worldview. That's the reality of DEI. That's my fire starter. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, <laughs> my favorite uh, new topic a daily dose of Stephen A. Smith. But before I do that, I want to talk to you guys about our great friends at Nugenics. Guys, are you the same guy you were 10 years ago? I'm not, although I'm trying to get better. One day you realize you didn't have that same energy, same lean muscle mass, or the get up and go that you had in the bedroom that you used to. As we age, we lose testosterone. They call it the man hormone. I call it the fire. But there's a real solution, the powerful testosterone booster in Nugenics Total T. Nugenics Total T testosterone booster with Testafin will help you turn back the clock and re-energize your life. Prove it to yourself risk-free. Try Nugenics Total T before you buy. There's nothing to lose and everything to gain. New energy, muscle, drive, even more passion. Get your complimentary sample when you text 231231 and enter the keyword fearless. Nugenics Total T's Power Boost is backed by clinical studies and real science. Nugenics key ingredients like testafin have been shown to boost free testosterone levels in men. In other words, it's based in science and it works. Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea when you text 231231 and enter the keyword fearless. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo X, the newest and most powerful fat incinerator ever with key ingredients to help you lose fat fast and get lean fast. Absolutely free. All you gotta do is text 231231, enter the keyword fearless, 231231, keyword fearless. Texting enrolls you into reoccurring automated text messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates may apply. The number one doctor recommended brand by primary care physicians based on an independent survey conducted by IQVIA 2022. All right, you can email me and us at fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. Uh, <laughs> Your daily dose of uh, Stephen A. Smith Cappin. Next. These words are our religion, our regrets, and our decisions. We don't want to go to heaven with freedom. It's my obligation, no hate, discrimination, raising up your hands for freedom. Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here, harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice, no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? 
his ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice, his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the Most High. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possessions. The H, humility. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0 right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. Welcome back. All right, uh, time for your uh, daily dose of Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> last week we started this, and, and I, I want to start with something from last week before I get into this new Stephen A. Smith stuff, uh, stuff he said during an interview with Mark Jackson. Uh, but I, I want to start with sock number 10. This is from last week when I broke down to you all the Run DMC story as it relates to Stephen A. Smith. If you remember uh, last week's uh, Jam Master J's murderers were finally convicted 21, 22 years after the murder of Jam Master J. Stephen A. Smith tried to personalize the story by talking about his brother, his older brother Basil was uh, very, very good friends with uh, Jam Master J and Stephen A. felt this personally. And you know, we grew up on the same block as Run DMC. And so I pointed out to you all just how foolish that was because Stephen A. Smith's brother, seven, eight years older than Jam Master J, Stephen A. Smith's brother left, according to Stephen A. Smith, left Hollis, Queens in 1976, 1977 to join the Air Force. At the time, Jam Master J would have been 11 years old. And so it just made no sense how an 18-year-old kid, and, you know, according to Stephen A., his brother uh, didn't get along with his dad and basically never came back to New York. And so it, it's just Stephen A. Smith just flat out capping. And people sent me, Jason, uh, you didn't even do no research. Didn't you see where Reverend Run from Run DMC, he did an interview with Rich Eisen talking about how he grew up with Stephen A. Smith I want to play the clip and then explain to you what Reverend Run actually said. Let's play the clip. Tell this story you told me back in the green room. Who would be on the street in Hollis? Who did you see growing up in Hollis? You told me. Oh, Stephen A. Smith is from Hollis, Queens, two blocks from me. I live on 205 Street. Mm -hmm. Stephen A. Smith lives on 203rd Street. He walks down the block. What up, Joey? <laughs> you don't think nothing. He's not screaming. He's not like, one game? One game? You mean to tell me that Block can't win one game? He's not that. He's just, what up, Joey? You see this tall guy walking down the block. I don't know he's in the sports. What up, Steve? Ain't nothing, Joey. Now I look on TV, he's like screaming and, and no sports inside out. So I want you to just evaluate what he's saying here. I lived on 205, Stephen lived on 203, 
and we waved at each other. I, I, I think, and I think this interview is from 2018 with Rich Eisen, and, and I think that Reverend Run, in my view, is telling one of those conversational exaggerations. He's talking with uh, Rich Eisen, and, and previously before, at the beginning of that clip, we didn't show you, they're talking about the NWA movie, and so then they're saying, what if they did a movie about Run DMC, and Rich Eisen's basically saying, who, who was in your neighborhood when you were growing up? And so in that moment, Reverend Run is sitting there saying, well, Stephen A. Smith and his family were relatively close to us, and so, and I'm, in, in proximity, close to us. So I'm gonna tell the story that, yeah, Stephen A. Smith was on my block and we occasionally waved at each other. Here's how you know this is just like an innocent exaggeration or, you know, I don't wanna call it a lie, but it, it's just an exaggeration. He's just being conversational. He's trying to do a good interview for Rich Eisen. So he slightly stretches the truth. I would see Stephen A. Smith and we would wave each other. Here's this tall guy, tall guy. Stephen A. Smith, in his book and in countless interviews, said he graduated high school at five foot nine, 130 pounds. Stephen A. was a scrawny little kid who got held back in fourth grade. Reverend Run never saw some tall, skinny guy waving at him. He saw a scrawny little punk, perhaps, waving at him. That's it. But this is a little exaggeration just to tell a good story with Rich Eisen. Nothing nefarious is going on. Nothing significant is going on. But I'm just sorry, guys. Stephen A. Smith may have grown up a couple of blocks from Run DMC. But neither Stephen A. Smith nor his brother had any real connection with the guys from Run DMC. His brother, because he's too old and moved away when these guys were little kids, and Stephen A. Smith, because just keeping it real, Stephen A. Smith was a little punk by his own admission that got held back in fourth grade and was the kid everybody felt sorry for, perhaps. So I, I just wanted to clarify the whole run DMC. He didn't see no little tall dude and just wave at each other. He, he's making conversation with Rich Eyes and, and just says something, tries to relate a story that, yeah, me and Stephen A. Smith grew up in the same neighborhood. Not a real story. That's one. So uh, on the Mark Jackson interview, moving to, he did this interview with Mark Jackson, a former NBA player, former NBA coach, uh, Stephen A., went back at the topic of how drug dealers saved his life and played an important role in the development of, of Stephen A. Smith. This is important because the puppet masters that I keep telling you all about, the, the, the elite secular people who reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there is a group of people for the black community that they have appointed as the leaders of the black community, of the spokesmen for the black community. This is how someone like Jay-Z, who brags about being a dope dealer, and then converted to being a rapper. So tell me which one of these two positions, dope dealer, rapper, qualify you for some sort of respected leadership voice? Is it the drug dealing or is it the rapping that makes you a leader? And, and just think about what Malcolm X said about the puppet masters who put entertainers out there as leaders of the black community. They, they've assigned it to a group of idiots a group of people without morals, a group of people with no ethics, a group of people willing to harm their own to help themselves. 
Do you understand the connection and how these people are selected for leadership positions? They're willing to harm the people in their community to help themselves. That's what a drug dealer does. That's what a rapper does. And so everybody at this point realizes that the most respected positions in the popular culture, in the world for black, rapper. That's why even if you're a rapper who never put out an album, never had any notoriety, newspapers and the media will pick up, oh, such and such rapper died. Young Dolph. Now, Young Dolph is famous in Memphis, but it turns into a national story because, you know, he's a rapper. And oh my God, a rapper has died. And this is very, very important. Black doctor dies, it's just local news. Maybe there's a, 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 a obituary in the newspaper, but no one cares. A rapper, that's major news. Black rapper dies. It's like, do you ever hear about struggling rock band musicians and there'll be some headline, struggling rocker dies? No, unless you make it big, it just ain't notable. And no one cares that you were in a local band. But with rappers, they are exalted and put on a pedestal. Stephen A. Smith knows this. And the entire culture knows this. And that's why he wants to brag about rapper, uh, drug dealers playing this incredible role in his life. Uh, let's play the clip of Stephen A. talking to Mark Jackson about how uh, drug dealers, they saved his life. Where I was most indebted, and I wrote this in my book, Straight Shooter. Uh, you know, I New talk York about, Times bestseller, by the way. Sir. Thank you very much. I was like, yo, the drug dealers saved my life. I mean, I would come up in there, I would go in the park, and the only street light, the only light in the park was the street light right across the street on 204th Street and Hollis Avenue. And the light emanating from that corner right by the library would beam into the park, and that's the only way you could see. So I used to shoot like two, 300 jump shots a night when that was the only light in there, which is how I improved my jump shot. But I was the only one that the dealers allowed to stay in the park because that's where they was doing their thing. And they would be like, all right, we ain't gonna do it until this time. And you know, the cats that were running things would instruct all of them, leave him alone, don't bother him. Let him do his thing. And so they would let me sit out there and practice and shoot until it was time for them to start doing their thing. Then they would be like, little man, you gotta go home and then I would go home from there. They didn't have to do that. And so, and then you had other cats that try to get you, they try to recruit you and get you involved. First, they're gonna start out by coming to you, telling you to stand on the corner, do be on the lookout, you know, watch for 5 all of that other stuff. Other times they would come to you and they'd probably give you a nickel bag or whatever at the time and they'd be telling you, go ahead and do this or that. Those dealers wasn't having that. I was not to be touched. I was not to be messed with. I was not to be influenced. Leave him alone because they always viewed me as they told me, they told, they said I was militant, even back then. They were like, you gonna, you gonna fight for us one day, talking about black folks overall, period. They were like, you gonna be, you gonna do something where you fighting on our behalf. They didn't know whether I was gonna be a lawyer, I was gonna be in the media, but they knew I was gonna do something. And they, they were like, he is not to be touched. And nobody bothered me because of that. So I always give those cats those props because I remember this, and I've said this on many, many occasions to people. If you knew, if you truly, truly know anything about the streets, real hardcore street cats despise wannabes. Now, they understand there's certain cats that are caught up and they just got to do what they got to do. But if you have an opportunity to be something greater and you don't take advantage of it, they have no respect for you because you choosing this when you don't have to. They like In their eyes, we have to do this to survive. You don't. You're just trying to be something you're not. And they don't respect it. It's like my whole point is you can see a lot of hardcore cats or trying to, guys trying to be hardcore. And I'd look at them and be like, I get more respect than you because I know my lane. I know I'm not that. And I'm not trying to be that. And they respect that rather than you trying to be a part of a game you know you got no business being a part of. And I was never that guy. And they always respected that. <laughs> There's, <clears throat> and this is all part of the marketing myth that has been done 
and programming myth that has been done on the psyche of black people. We foolishly believe that drug dealers have this incredible wisdom and insight. And, and, and so Stephen A is selling that hard, that, oh, there was these drug dealers, and they just spotted and saw something in me. So incredible. Stephen A, I know you got held back in fourth grade. I know you can barely read. I, I, I know that counselors at high school are laughing at the thought of you going to college. Stephen A, I know your high school transcripts are so bad that you could only go to some fashion institute and, and talk your way onto their junior college basketball team. And then you're still so stupid that in order to get into college, you gotta go all the way down to North Carolina and Winston-Salem State University where at that time you really didn't even, all you needed was a GED to get into Winston-Salem State. But these drug dealers were so incredibly wise. Oh yeah, brother, you're gonna be fighting for us one day. You're gonna be very, very important. We can see it, whether it's a lawyer, I know you can't read, I know you can't write, but whether it's a lawyer or a doctor or rocket scientist, or, or, or maybe one day you'll be president of the United States, we can see that because we can see it because of the jump shot. You out here shooting basketball in the middle of the night with the street lights. There's only a light coming from this building and you out here shooting jump shots. And I can tell by the way you release that ball. Oh, you're going to be important one day. I can see it on the basketball court. This is how wise and clairvoyant drug dealers are. There, there are, but, but this is Hollywood. There are a handful, small handful, like in any profession, of wise dope dealers. The overwhelming majority of them are idiots. The overwhelming majority are idiots. Anybody that knows anything really about the street game. It is crowded with bona fide idiots and or a handful of wannabe trying to prove I'm street, just another version of an idiot. Now there's a tiny handful of successful drug dealers who actually have some wisdom, but most of them Complete idiots, and everybody knows this. And uh, federal penitentiaries are filled with those idiots. But Stephen A, because he's been programmed and trained by the puppet masters, and he's about promoting the agenda of the puppet masters, he's out selling to you all that, oh my God, Nino Brown, if he just knew another way, he would have been a doctor. Yeah, I, I know, he didn't know his daddy, and I know his mama was strung out on drugs, but oh God, if things had just been a little bit different, he would have been a doctor or a lawyer. Avon Barksdale, oh God, he was had so much promise, and he could have been X, Y, and Z. This is all the Hollywood myth. And was it Frank Lucas, the King of New York, and all these other guys, they put, Denzel played the role, what, what, American Gangster and all. They've hyped up all of these guys into a level of brilliance that they just don't have. And then it's, oh, they saved my life. How, Stephen A? And this is why the media is being overrun with former athletes who have made millions of dollars for developing their physical gifts and ignoring their intellectual gifts. 
That's why they're doing all the interviews and have all the successful shows. The entire conversation is being dumbed down intentionally so that plants and idiots like Stephen A. Smith sound smart and sound wise. This, this whole thing is it's very dangerous, very poisonous, very unwise. Stephen, this is all cap and an exaggeration and a flat out lie. I, I would love, you know, Stephen A starts out with, they saved my life. Well, how? What, what, what would, your life was in danger? What? You, were, you, you just said the street life wasn't about you. You certainly weren't built for it. You were going down that path if the, if the uh, dope dealers didn't say, Hands off him. That little boy that can't read, he's going to be president one day. Stephen A. has written a movie. He's turned his life into a movie. And it's a series of scenes intended to be set to film and to elevate and venerate and make Stephen A. the epitome of the American dream. Because they want you to believe what the American dream is, is that uh, the puppet masters can decide, hey, here's uh, an idiot. And if this idiot will hop on board with whatever message we want promoted. So, you know, and I know I'm risking my life here uh, talking about some of these idiots because they are idiots and they're violent, stupid idiots. But, but what the whole messaging behind rap music and what Stephen A., has, has, is selling here is that like, look, Birdman, this guy tatted up his face, he's a degenerate, he's sexually fluid, he's a complete idiot. But if he puts out the music that we tell him to, we'll make him one of the most powerful and influential people in all of the South and, and, and in the music industry. We'll do the same thing for Easy e Dr. Dre, any of these guys that will promote degeneracy and lunacy and, and uh, uh, wickedness, debauchery, radical materialism, we will make you extremely wealthy and powerful. We'll make you, you could be the next Jay-Z. That's the message. That's the American dream become so stupid and devoid of values that you can become a tool and a puppet for us and we will make you rich and powerful. Stephen A is selling that dream. He's not alone. There's a group of them all selling the same deal. And that's how to take, <clears throat> I'm gonna give you one last example. Take uh, the idiot Ben Crump. This man can barely speak. And somehow out of nowhere, thanks to Trayvon Martin, he becomes the replacement for Johnny Cochran. Now here Johnny Cochran was, whether you like him or not, this was a brilliant attorney, a brilliant orator and someone with command of the law who could practice law at the highest level with anybody in the history of law. And he's been replaced by Ben Crump, someone who can barely speak. How did that happen? How? He was installed. It was a message. It, it, it's, it's, it's his willingness to be devoid of any values and any real beliefs. It's his willingness to walk completely away from God. And so, yes, we can use Ben Crump. Stephen A is just a different version of Ben Crump. And this is what Cat Williams was talking about. And this is the opening, the awakening that I hope everyone is having. That these people that they front and centered and have promoted and have put at the top of the industry. They're all there by design. They're not there on merit. They're not there on excellence. They're not there because they want what's best for you. They're there to promote a message, a specific message. And as it relates to black people, it's a specific message about the lane black men need to be in. Promote 
illegality, sexual fluidity, and the matriarchy. And you too can be, and if you go read Stephen A's book, he takes a major dump on his father. And some of you may be, well, maybe his father was a bad guy. Before this book, go read what Stephen A. Smith used to say about his dad. You, go back, and there's interviews where Stephen A. talking in the early 2000s, mid-2010s, talking about his dad. Nothing like how he takes a dump on his father and celebrates his mother in his book. Now, go look at Stephen A. and Charles Barkley, as we showed you last week. How they, oh my God, the number one thing they support is gays, trans, and same-sex marriage, and abortion. And now here's Stephen A. Smith uh, telling you all, <laughs> these drug dealers, they saved my life. Now, he's testifying about drug dealers the way people used to testify about Jesus Christ. Who really saved your life? How can someone who, like Stephen A, who proclaims some sort of faith, he's crediting drug dealers? He's doing long interviews with Mark Jackson. And keep in mind, Mark, and this is where Mark Jackson, and I, I like Mark Jackson, and allegedly, Mark Jackson's a Christian, allegedly. And, and, and I, I use the word allegedly only because of what I'm just seeing in this interview. I, I couldn't sit there as a Christian and listen to some man credit drug dealers with saving his life, knowing how BS the story is for one, but then two, just as a Christian, I'm just saying, no, nah, brother, you here through the grace of Jesus Christ. That could be the only response if I'm thinking and evaluating the world through a biblical lens. That's the only thing that would pop up in my mind. I couldn't nod my head and co-sign and, and, and celebrate this. But I, I don't want to take too big of a dump on Mark Jackson. He, he's a basketball coach and a basketball player. He's not a journalist. I don't know how quick these guys are on their feet in a real conversation, but what, what Stephen A. was promoting there, complete lunacy and idiocy, but he's certainly on message for what the puppet masters, what the elites want promoted to black men. Drug dealers, sexual fluidity, and your mama are responsible for anything good that happens to you. Jesus Christ has nothing to do with it. And, and probably for these guys, he doesn't have anything to do with this because the devil certainly has his rewards as well, and Stephen A. is enjoying them. That's your daily dose of Stephen A. Smith. When I come back, <clears throat> I got some thoughts on uh, Shannon Sharp and falling in love with uh, black Twitter, the consequences for that. Next. really uttered the phrase, well, the money doesn't matter. Bring it up. Oh. Are you people crazy? It always matters. It, it always matters. This is why we negotiate deals. This is why we have minimum wages and you try to get raises and you try to get promotions. Jim Smith, you've done a hell of a lousy job. Jim, I'm sorry, you're fired. Get out of here. Pat is just saying something that can be relatively uncomfortable to a lot of people. But in the words of Gordon Gecko, whether you agree with him or not, what was that phrase, gentlemen? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. I mean, now, the, the downside is, will you do anything for money? See, that's where it gets a little cloudy to me. Like, what is the price of fame that you're willing to pay? Uh, as we're seeing in the hip-hop industry with Freak Mill. I mean, my God, that's repulsive. But anyway. <laughs> getting come by my real name. Yeah, okay. Me. Want respect, Grandma? The socks cost four hundred thousand just to suck. All right, welcome back. Uh, Shannon Sharp uh, is learning the consequences of his love affair with uh, black social media, black Twitter in particular. 
Uh, Shannon Sharp this weekend, I believe, released a video of himself out in front of Total Wine. He was out doing some wine shopping. And I don't think it got the reaction and the result that uh, Shannon was looking for. Uh, let's start with the original video of uh, Shannon Sharp uh, walking us through his Saturday or Sunday at Total Wine. Here's the final stop of the day. Total Wine. Total Wine started over there. My last stop of the day. We got up early, had a late night. We don't do excuses here. We just get the job done. But this one we signed up for. Uh, so that's uh, Shay Shay out doing a little shopping uh, <laughs> for wine, and, and there were individual pictures released. But then, I mean, almost instantly, like three, four hours after he dropped uh, this video, uh, there started to be parody videos uh, released over social media. Here's two of the best ones. Let's play the first one. Today... We got up early, we don't make excuses, but today we finna go in here and get a couple of lines. We gonna see what today consists of, cause we don't make excuses, come on and follow. <laughs> uh, so that's the first one. Uh, this one is probably uh, the most vicious one. Uh, let's play that. Okay, everybody. We just landed. We got all them people in the back. We on our way to go get us some wine. The only thing we doing today, we ain't doing too much, but we got it. You know what I'm saying? Come on, follow me. We have a good day today. And so <laughs> the pictures and the videos, bottom line is uh, the zesty rumors about Shannon Sharp are getting wider and wider and more pervasive. And he, Shannon Sharp has been upset with Mike Epps and Eddie Griffin and uh, comedians that have been going at him ever since the Cat Williams interview. And, and it's starting to spread like wildfire. And, and so Shannon Sharp built an entire persona built around pleasing black Twitter. And now black Twitter is coming for Shannon Sharp. And, and I, I just don't think Shannon has thought this through. I, I don't. Th this entire uh, movement that athletes are, are in, and again, their handlers and the puppet masters, all this whole fashion thing that men, and particularly black men, have been, this lane they've been put in. How, how far can you push the envelope? in terms of fashion? How sexually fluid in terms of fashion can you be? And so Shannon Sharp loves to wear the tightest clothes he can possibly wear at all times. He now has committed to carrying a purse or a bag or whatever. And it's, it's no different. Remember, I used to get on uh, Cam Newton, and this is why Cam Newton is upset with me, but I was right, and I was just trying to give Cam great advice. Remember when Cam used to wear the bonnet around his head at press conferences and all that, and I'm just like, what are you doing, man? You're trying to be a leader of men. This is going to blow up in your face. But there's been all of this messaging for black men that there's great wealth great celebrity and fame, great support, if you make your persona more sexually fluid. 
And these guys are going for it. And, and, and so now Shannon Sharp's taping himself getting out of a car and they're showing pictures of him standing very zestily outside of his SUV. They're now making videos, uh, making fun of him, how he walks, how he presents himself. It, it, it's, he has sparked a conversation about himself, all in the pursuit of money. And remember, uh, Shannon got very upset. He let, let his card show. Like, hey, man, my kids are calling me about this stuff that Mike Epps and these guys are saying, and, and this is bothering me. And then he said, well, if it don't affect my money, I don't care. But this is affecting your reputation and standing with your own kids and with uh, men who are in a proper mindset and just wondering, like, how did we get a Hall of Fame football player to, to, you know what, put on something real, real tight, as close to yoga pants as you can, and put this orange purse around your neck, and so I'm out wine shopping. Huh? I mean, seriously, what, what are we doing here? And I would, I'm saying this, to Shannon, but I'm also saying it to these other athletes. As you uh, get ready to walk into an NBA arena, get ready to walk into a football stadium, and ESPN and the whole Fox Sports and the whole corporate media structure has said, we've turned walking into the NBA arena into a, a fashion runway. We've turned walking into an NFL stadium into a fashion runway. Guys, put on the most sexually fluid clothes you can, many bright colors, as tight as you can, put on a bonnet, do, do all of that, and walk into the arena, and we're going to celebrate it. Put a dress on, and we're going to celebrate it. I, I just want all of this money and fame y'all chasing, is it really all worth it? As you look at What's going on with Diddy right now and Meek Mill? They, they, you know, I had someone at the highest level of sports, the highest level of sports. He's been involved in sports at the ownership level. He's been in sports at the coaching level. He's been in sports at the playing level. And, and one of the things he, he, he told me was, Hey, man, you got to remember who these owners are. They're in the music industry. They're in Hollywood as well. Their names may not be completely attached to the music industry or Hollywood, but trust me, they're all going to the same parties. They all have the same friends. They're all invested in the same thing. So we shouldn't be surprised that the music industry and their culture and the Hollywood industry and their culture has invaded sports. This is what ownership wants. They're all the same group of people. And so as you watch all of these athletes, none of them with the discipline, just, hey, let me take this check and let me stick to my values. All of them are saying, hey, this is what's popular. This is what makes you famous over social media. This is what they want on TikTok. Shannon Sharp releases. Could you imagine being 55 years old and going, yeah, let me put out a video of me shopping for wine. Let me put it out on TikTok. The kids are going to love it. Could you imagine being 55 and, and, and they've put you in a trick bag where your money and wealth is tied to pleasing what's popular over TikTok. TikTok is run by China. TikTok in America wants our people sexually fluid, feminized, and obsessed with being a consumer and name brand products and radical materialism. 
And these guys have jumped in with both feet because they have no discipline. They have no values that, that require, like, man, all money ain't good money. And you know what? I'm going to go without so I can hold on to my values and my dignity. When you walk completely away from God in a biblical worldview, that's what you do. You make decisions. Whatever makes me rich and famous, I'm willing to do it. And I will play with my reputation and I will compromise my reputation. I will compromise my values in order to be rich and famous. I, it's, it's not hard for me to understand. You take some rapper who's been in jail, who didn't graduate from high school, who has an IQ of around 50 or 60, and who's been selling dope for the past five years, and you offer them money, hey, make this stupid rap music, make this degenerate rap music, and we'll make you rich and famous. I, I get how Birdman and these other guys made that decision. But when you've been a Hall of Fame football player and have made millions of dollars, and you can't draw a line and say, nah, I ain't gonna do that. I got enough money. I'll make it without that. I'll go a different route. When you're making the exact same decisions as someone who didn't graduate high school or barely graduated high school, is strung out on drugs, was probably sexually violated when they were eight, nine, 10 years old. When you're making the exact same decision they would make and you're selling out the exact same way they sold out, you need to look in the mirror and say, how come I'm not strong enough to stand on anything that I truly believe? Or, or, or is the only thing I truly believe is the more money I got, the better I am. Shannon Sharp's paying a price. Uh, it, it'll be interesting if he, if he snaps out of it. It's, it's certainly hilarious <laughs> watching these people uh, make fun of Shannon Sharp. The same people that built him up are now in the process of tearing Shannon Sharp down. All right. You got my thoughts on DEI. You got my thoughts on Stephen A. Smith today. You got my thoughts on Shannon Sharp. We'll play tomorrow and we'll see you tomorrow. I want freedom No negotiation, my sister, no relation We all just want to have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all receiving We all want to be free We want